everybody, welcome to LACNET's September Patient Education Seminar. Um, we're at UCLA. Um, thank you so much for joining us and everyone on the live stream. Thank you for joining us live and tuning in. We have an, a very hot topic today. Um, we've gotten a great response from it, so I'm very excited for it. A few announcements before we get started. For those of you who are tuning in live, there's a question submission box next to the screen where you're watching us and you can submit all your questions on there, or if it's not working or you can't figure it out, please feel free to send it any questions to events at lacnets.org. And a couple more announcements. Um, tomorrow, there's an awesome carcinoid syndrome web series going on, um, Wednesday, September 13th, tomorrow, at 4 p.m. Pacific time. Um, it will feature Dr. Michael, Dr. Michael Morse. So if you want to register for this webinar, you can find the link on the LACNET's Facebook page. Scroll down a few posts, and we have the link right there to register. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, who's going to be covering medical marijuana and symptom management, which has been um, a very hot topic recently. Dr. Thomas Strauss is professor of clinical psychiatry and the inaugural holder of the Maddie Katz Chair in Palliative Care Research and Education. He is also the medical director of Stuart and Linda Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital at UCLA and vice chair for clinical affairs in the David Geffen UCLA School of Medicine Department of Psychiatry. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Strauss. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yes, am I... Is this working, this mic? Can you hear me? Good, terrific. So it's nice to be back. Um, I actually uh, uh, did a LACNETS thing with Ed Wolin at Cedars a few years ago before he blew town um, and worked side by side with Ed for many years at the Cancer Center um, where I kind of became a palliative care physician. So I'm, I'm, I'm now back at UCLA, which is my home. Uh, and um, my day job is running the psych hospital, but I continue to be involved in palliative medicine as well. And so really my interest in the topic of cannabinoids comes directly from my thirst for having as clear a view as I can for what does the scientific evidence tell us about um, a role for cannabinoids in one form or another in the care of patients with one form of cancer or another. Um, that means that what I say will probably be disappointing because the answer is there's no evidence in almost all of the areas where you're curious. Um, uh, I also run the risk of making myself unpopular. I gave an early version of this talk uh, at the Sims Mann uh, Center, which as you know does quarterly or monthly cancer-related educa edu public education talks. And the fact that I dared to say that there were people in situations where cannabis might be problematic, like young people with rapidly developing brains, like people with pre-existing major psychiatric illness, um, was experienced by at least some people in the audience as me wanting to um, take their handguns from their cold, dead arms to borrow from Charlton Heston. My goal is not to deprive anyone of access to cannabis, only to share with you uh, the best evidence as I understand it. And so that is what I'll do. And I know you guys have interesting questions. Actually, you guys shared some of them with me, which, and they're very impressive in their thoughtfulness. I'll do my best. Um, here's something that you might be interested in. This is available for free off the internet. This is um, a major monograph actually produced by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, re released in the spring of this year. Just Google National Academies Cannabis and you can get your very own free PDF of this and, and you can see if what I've told you is accurate after you review it. There's sort of a, you know, um, executive summary as well as detailed with chapters on specific topics. But this has really been terrific in advancing our knowledge. By the way, what do I mean when I say cannabinoids? I've already used the term. So, um, of course, generally these are uh, plant-grown materials that occur naturally. With a few exceptions, they're not regulated by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Uh, they are generally edible or drinkable or volatile, meaning you can burn them or in some other way um, make them um, volatile in air and inhale them. Um, they can be bought from legal marijuana dispensaries or from street suppliers. And generally, we think about three classes of compounds, which are the, the ones that occur in the plant, ones that are synthesized, meaning made in a lab, and then this very interesting group called the endocannabinoids. That is, the, the cannabinoids are actually produced by the central nervous system of mammals, like us. 
So we have an, an endogenous opioid system. We make our own opioids that help us respond to pain and stress, and we make our own cannabinoids. The challenge is, or the interesting thing is, we make them in, in extremely small quantities compared to what you get when you ingest, um, and, and that raises interesting questions about what you do to your brain when you take a whole lot of them, which we might or might not get into. So this was um, a New York Times second page ad that was uh, published in, um, actually, 2014. Uh, very uh, interesting ad here. We have um, things that kind of look like the periodic table of the elements, and a little, um, for all of you, all, those of you old enough to remember, a little diss at Nancy Reagan, just say no, but with a K-N-O-W rather than an O. The idea is if you inform yourself about cannabis, of course, you will want it. Um, and um, we're going to see um, these two healthy young specimens a little later on. But the idea is Ian chose an indica cannabis to, to help with his MS symptoms. And uh, while fighting cancer, Molly preferred sativa. Okay. What's the evidence to support that sativa is good for helping fight cancer? And, uh, indi in, and uh, indica is helpful for zero, um, except street lore. But, you know, that's what we're prepared to um, act on in general. So um, this is a map of the country, which is now, as you can see, about nine months old. But I think it's still current. We now have 29 states, including D.C., that have some form of legalized marijuana. Generally, that includes uh, a situation where so-called medical marijuana uh, is permitted. It's worth pointing out that a lot of people think that you go to a doctor for a prescription of medical marijuana. That's not how it works in California. What you go to a doctor for is an endorsement or an attestation that you have an, an illness for which he or she thinks medical marijuana might have a role, for example, in relieving symptoms. Um, and as some of you know, a lot of the dispensaries have a doctor like that sitting in their waiting room who you pay $40 to, um, who in five minutes ask you what symptoms you're having in generally, and I'll show you the California list it's, it's sort of, you know, it's sort of what people say about making laws, right? It's like you don't want to see sausage being made and you don't want to see laws being made. The California list is a list of commonly held beliefs about things for which marijuana is effective with almost no evidence supporting it. And that's generally true around the country. Um, but Americans seem to think that um, doctors should be allowed to prescribe small amounts of marijuana for patients suffering from serious illness. Uh, in fact, almost 90% in this ABC News poll from about a year and a half ago. There are... Two drugs in three forms currently approved by the US FDA. Most people have heard of some of them. Dronabinol, or Marinol, which has been around forever. Uh, Sesamet, or Nabilone, which has also been around a long time. And, and Syndros, which is an oral liquid form of Dronabinol that actually just came on the market about two or three months ago. I know this because the rep who represents it is calling on me incessantly. Um, um, so um, these are FDA approved for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, CINV. And in the case uh, of dronabinol, in the early years of the AIDS epidemic, when, when the, we had no effective treatments and when lots of people got an advanced wasting syndrome, also approved for AIDS wasting syndrome with the idea that it might stimulate appetite. The evidence for that is very small. Um, we have better things, but it also carries those FDA indications. Perhaps some of you have or know people who have tried these in general. They are not particularly um, uh, uh, attractive to patients. They tend to not particularly like how they feel on them. Um, and um, my experience is people often prefer the sort of um, the psychosocial and um, c controlling your dose experience of uh, dispensary based cannabinoid products. But that's just an, an impression that I have. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk really quickly about marijuana in the brain. It's not the emphasis today. The take home is. If you use marijuana heavily, particularly if you do it beginning in latency or adolescence and into your mid-20s, it's probably not good for your brain. That's not really a surprise. We all know people who got derailed. Um, you know, I was watching Fast Times at Ridgemont High again <laughs> last week, and there was Sean Penn, you know, the adorable Sean Penn. But I, that's the image that comes to my mind when I think about the marijuana slacker. Um, but that term was not chosen randomly. So what we know is heavy exposure, particularly early in life, impacts adversely cognitive capacity, your IQ goes down, your motivation to do stuff, and increases significantly the risk of developing a psychotic illness like schizophrenia. Now, if you have geno no genetic risk for that disorder, it doesn't mean it's creating new cases, um, but there does seem to be an unfortunate connection there. And uh, because my day job is running a psychiatric hospital, I can tell you that we daily admit young people, some of them students on this campus, who have a first psychotic episode that is associated with heavy cannabis use. And we have a very strong sense that for those people, 
avoidance of cannabis over time is a very important element of maintaining well-being. So, um, you know, that's just something that we need to recognize. Now, of course, most people contending with a serious cancer diagnosis are not adolescents. There are some, but they're not, that's not who we are in this room, and that's not really the major audience that we're considering. But the point is not benign. I'm not going to bore you with the details. Uh, I will say one other thing, which is there is essentially no good controlled trial evidence that can cannabis is a treatment for depression or a treatment for anxiety. There's a big struggle in the VA right now because there are a number of men and women with post-traumatic stress disorder associated with combat who have had what they believe to be very salutary benefit from cannabinoids for PTSD. That may well be the case. Um, there is some preclinical science, that is test tube and, and early experimental science, that one element of cannabis, namely cannabidiol or CBD, may actually have some antipsychotic properties. So there could be something going on there, but none of it's ready for prime time. Um, so, and, and since uh, uh, many of the audiences to which I give this talk are psychiatric audience, there are no surprises here. Um, but there's stuff we don't know, which is, you know, exactly what age is highest risk and how much is a bad amount and um, how frequently is a bad frequency, et cetera. Okay, so that's, this is really, I think, the, the, the center of the target for today's talk, which is what's the evidence for clinical efficacy? And I'll tell you, and then I'll tell you again, and then I'll tell you again. The evidence for clinical efficacy from reasonably good clinical trials is can it cannabinoid, cannabinoids can be effective for nausea and vomiting, particularly in cancer chemotherapy, and cannabinoids can be effective for pain, particularly neuropathic pain. That's pain associated with, with injury to the nervous system, and that includes some kinds of neuropathic pain that some people can get with cancer chemotherapies, um, but other um, chem I mean, ever neuro neuropathic pain states as well. There's a little bit of evidence about symptom relief in MS, particularly with spasticity. That's it. Everything else is anecdote, speculation, personal experience. And there's nothing wrong with anecdote or personal experience, but that's really what the clinical trials evidence tells us. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the idea that there's reasonable clinical evidence that um, cannabinoids have anti-tumor properties. Dr. Heck may wish to speak to this. There's some, again, preclinical lab evidence that if you put en enough cannabidiol in a test tube with prostate cancer cells, for example, some of them may die. But the idea, and this actually seems to be where we re really enter into the dangerous spectrum, the idea that there's compelling evidence, including the guy in Canada, that cannabis will treat your cancer and therefore you don't have to do all that industrial um, pharmaceutical complex stuff, that's just unsupported. So one of the take home messages over and over again will be, if you're thinking about this, do it in consultation with whoever's treating you, in this case, treating your carcinoid or your neuroendocrine tumor. When I got into this world in the early 80s, before I went to medical school, I was studying the use of, of um, what we now call CAM, complementary and alternative medicine, what we then called alternative therapies in people with cancer uh, that were being treated at the, at the Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania. And in those days, it was a secret. In those days, patients didn't want us letting their oncologists know what they were doing, right? Which just seems crazy. Um, because what about the potential for drug interactions? What about the potential for, for tumor-promoting effect, et cetera? There was, it was just unfortunate. I think we're not there anymore. Um, I think we're now at a place where m most people practicing now recognize that CAM is everywhere, that most patients are exposed to it, have questions about it, may want to do it, and the idea of a partnership or an open dialogue seems to be much more common. Would anyone disagree with that statement? Have you been laughed out of an exam room by a physician who says, oh, if you want to do that, I won't be your doctor anymore, which used to be how it was done? You've, you've had that experience. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. I think it's much less common than it was. Um, this is old stuff. One of the big challenges when we're talking about um, whole marijuana products, the leaf, is we're talking in one leaf about probably 400 different molecules, right? Most of the studies are of just two molecules, THC, which is tetrahydrocannabinol, and CBD, which is cannabidiol. But if you're looking at the whole leaf, you're looking at these and many other compounds. Um, some of the operators of dispensaries assert, and I have no reason to doubt them, that they send every batch of whole leaf marijuana that they purchase from growers to a lab for uh, rigorous scientific analysis so they know exactly what's in it, and then it's posted in the window I mean, I haven't spent a lot of time in dispensaries, but I've seen that. And maybe that's correct. But the, the point is we rely on their word for quality control because that's all we have. 
you know, you may not like the pharmaceutical industrial complex, but you have a reasonable good likelihood that when you buy a bottle of Prozac, there are actually 20 milligrams of fluoxetine in each tablet and not a bunch of other stuff that happened to be in the growing environment that somebody added. Um, so this, you've already heard this, um, uh, so I'm not going to repeat it. This is from slightly earlier um, data uh, analysis than, than the National Academy's green one that I showed you early on. And here it is, again, just to go through the words one more time. You see the green background theme. I, maybe they chose that purposefully at the National Academy of Science just to be cute. In adults with chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, oral cannabinoids are effective antimatics. That's why we have three products you can buy. In adults with chronic pain, patients who were treated with cannabis or cannabinoids are more likely to experience a clinically significant reduction in pain symptoms. So that doesn't quite go at the neuropathic pain thing. That's a more general statement about chronic pain. There are people with chronic back pain who, in, who are sure that cannabinoids help them. More power to them. We don't really have much in the way of studies to support that. In adults with MS, there's um, some evidence of um, reduced spasticity, like bladder spasticity and skeletal muscle spasticity in short-term use of oral cannabinoids. It's not clear whether that effect lasts. Um, and these are kind of modest effects. By the way, there are no head-to-head -head trials. It would be really interesting. Wouldn't it be interesting if there were head-to-head -head trials of Zofran with um, you know, oral cannabinoids? Not been done. Don't know who would pay for that study. Probably not the makers of Zofran. Um, maybe, the, the, maybe big cannabis, which as you know is out there. Um, but we, we don't have any comparative data. Um, and then there's little other utility. There's one very interesting recent uh, high quality trial um, I don't know how many of you know this world, but there's been a big um, underground um, pure CBD for, for treatment-resistant childhood epilepsy movement, particularly in Colorado, Charlotte's Web, blah, blah, blah. There's a neurologist at New York University called Oren Davinsky who's been really interested in this for a long time. And if you talk to any pediatric neurologist who treats kids with epilepsy, they know about this because parents are doing it and parents are asking about it. Just a couple months ago in the New England Journal was a really high quality uh, double blind placebo controlled trial of, of oral cannabidiol, pure cannabidiol um, for drug resistant seizures in Dravet syndrome, which is one of the particularly um, challenging treatment resistant childhood epilepsies. And the finding was that oral cannabidiol uh, significantly reduced seizure frequency, didn't fix it, didn't cure it. Interestingly, there was a higher discontinuation rate for side effects in the kids who got randomized to cannabidiol versus the kids who got randomized to placebo which is just kind of curious, right? Because CBD is supposed to be the, the relatively easy to take component of marijuana. You know, it isn't psychotropic, doesn't make you hallucinate, doesn't make you anxious, but that was just found. But there was a, a real effect. So this is, you know, this is real clinical evidence that there's a, that there's a potential role. Um, we talked a little bit about reliability and reproducibility of effects as you go to, uh, to the uh, cooperative or dispensary. I just want to share with you one little trial that I thought was curious and interesting. So this was um, 75 products that had been randomly purchased from dispensaries in three different cities, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Seattle. The labeling of the amount of THC and the relative balance of C THC and CBD uh, was accurate in only 17% of those samples. Mostly they were over-labeled, which means there was 10% or less content than claimed. Um, but actually almost a quarter were underlabeled, meaning you got more bang for your buck. There was more there than you, you, bought, you bargained for. And in L LA, you tended to get more for your money. Don't know why that would be. But LA, statistically significantly underlabeled compared to San Francisco. And now this is hardly you know, enduring science, but it just confirms my point. You really aren't sure what you're getting. Um, so what about the pharmacology? We don't really know what the mechanism is by which cannabinoids um, work. Um, there's, of course, um, the idea that since we have cannabinoid, an, an endogenous cannabinoid system, we make our own and we have receptors to bind them, that would, it seems logical that that would be the mechanism by which they produce all of the effects. But that doesn't seem to be the case. At least um, for the, the analgesic or pain-relieving effect, it looks like it has more to do with something happening in the, ba in the dorsal horn. That's the back part of your spinal cord. And lots of molecules that, that relieve pain seem to work in the dorsal horn and the spinal cord, so that's actually not that surprising. But this is not perfectly worked out either. Um, so I'm not going to bore you too much with, with the clinical trials, just to give you a sense of what's been done. So this was a, a trial done at um, UC San Francisco by an uh, eminent medical oncologist and palliative care doctor named Donald Abrams. It was the first ever published only 10 years ago. This um, was three times a day cannabis or cannabis-like, but with all the cannabis extracted from it, cigarettes. Um, 
in a group of people with severe HIV-related peripheral neuropathy, which is one of the most horrid complications of the early days of the AIDS epidemic, and a very robust effect. That is, the group that got the active drug had 34% decrease in pain, which was statistically significant, and um, about half the patients who got the drug had a 30% or more pain reduction. If you have a new drug that's a pain drug, and you present data like that to the FDA, that's a home run. That those, those impacts on pain are considered um, surpassing the threshold for effectiveness. Now, this study was kind of problematic because these um, people were all habitual marijuana smokers and probably knew within 20 seconds of the first <laughs> whether they were getting extracted or active drug. And this was drug that had to be bought from the federal pot farm in Mississippi, um, which um, doesn't grow particularly good pot, I'm told. Um, um, I don't know. Um, so, you know, an early tr clinical trial. But this is, by the way, California has led the nation. So, you know, um, medical marijuana has been legalized in California for 21 years, since, 2000, since 1996. And in its forward-looking way, back when we had a forward-looking legislature, the legislature actually mandated a University of California-based study center for, for cannabis, which is based at UC San Diego, which was, which was uh, charged with doing clinical trials. The challenge is, because cannabis is illegal according to the federal um, schedule, um, that it's very hard to do clinical trials, e even though the state endorsed the idea of it. So we have not as much from this group as you would hope. Um, again, low-dose vaporized cannabis, effective for pain. Not going to bore you with the details. Um, I was talking um, a little bit before we started about Sativex. So Sativex is an interesting compound. This is actually a pharmaceutically prepared compound. It's a liquid. It's approved by the Canadian version of the FDA. It's not available in the United States. And in a number of European countries, it's also been approved. So it's a one-to-one -one oral liquid. This is kind of what it looks like. A one-to-one -one oral liquid with, a, uh, a, with a, uh, an equal ratio of THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, and CBD cannabidiol. So that was a study of that um, compound versus pure THC versus placebo. Again, in intractable or very severe, hard-to-treat cancer pain. Um, and uh, the finding was that this was superior uh, both to pure THC and the placebo. Um, and again, I don't want to bore you with the details, but um, uh, this drug has been stuck in phase three trials in the United States for a couple of years, which makes me think something bad is happening and we may or may not see it legally here. I don't know of anybody who's, um, who's brought it into the country from Canada, although my guess is there are such people. Another trial from one of the leaders of our field, Russ Portnoy, again showing a, a robust effect. <coughs> um, so that's kind of the world's uh, literature. There's a little bit uh, uh, regarding uh, anti-inflammatory and disease-modifying properties for cannabis in inflammatory bowel disease, um, but this study has been criticized. Um, okay, what about public health considerations? A few words on that. Um, very interesting observation uh, published a couple years ago that uh, opioid overdose deaths seem to go down in the states where medical marijuana had been legalized. Um, now, the mechanism of that has not been worked out. It might be that people using recreational opioids substituted marijuana for the recreational use. It might be that people using opioids for pain got relief from marijuana and took fewer or no opioids. Um, we don't know, but it's a really interesting observation, particularly as anyone who reads a newspaper knows, we were in the midst of a scourge of opioid um, abuse and, and overdose deaths. And you can say lots of stuff about marijuana, but um, a true statement is nobody ever died of a, marijuana over, of a pure marijuana overdose. So, you know, it doesn't do the, the things that kill people when they take too much opiate. It doesn't depress your respirations. Um, and uh, that's perhaps a, a fundamentally different um, sort of safety profile. Uh, it's also interesting, and again, by no means, uh, well, actually, let me say one other word. Uh, so there is a pulmonologist at UCLA named Donald Tashkin who has actually done most of the world's clinical research on the effects of marijuana smoke on your lungs. And he was the first to show that um, marijuana smoke does not seem to do to your lungs what tobacco smoke does. Probably not a great thing to be singeing uh, the cilia of your upper respiratory tract with anything, but it does, does not look like marijuana increases rates of lung cancer. And very interestingly, it does not look like marijuana uh, increases rates of some of the other things that happen to people who smoke tobacco a lot, like development of cardi cardiovascular disease, um, development of increasing um, uh, girth in your midsection, and worsening of your lung function. 
and then a bunch of other factors that seem to increase risk for, um, for cardiac morbidity and mortality, like um, increasing your hemoglobin A1C and your triglyceride levels and your blood pressure and your cholesterol. So that's also very interesting. And if confirmed, this again might suggest that there's something kind of different about cannabinoids than about nicotine and, and the other elements that are in to tobacco smoke. Uh, another um, kind of health economics finding, which is that in states where medical marijuana has been uh, authorized, that Medicare pays less for prescription medicines, particularly prescription medicines that it appears marijuana might replace or make unnecessary, sleeping pills, pain pills, anti-anxiety pills. Just an epidemiologic evalu uh, analysis, but a, a curious one. Um, uh, earlier, somebody asked me about drug interactions, and the, 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 the best answer is the evidence is very scant. I think it's fair to say that, again, in the test tube at least, uh, the important compounds and cannabinoids that we've already talked about don't seem to have much of an effect on what are called the CYP450 system, which are the enzymes in your liver and some other tissues that are responsible for much of metabolizing drugs that you take. So what that might, that means that if, if this bears out, it's unlikely that cannabinoids would dramatically alter blood levels of other medications you're taking, whether that's a high blood pressure medicine or cholesterol lowering medicine or chemotherapy. Um, but, but there is not, we don't have the ability to look up in a, in a computerized database the way we do with FDA approved drugs. You know, what's the effect of cannabis on drug A, B, or C? We just don't have that evidence, don't have that data. Um, uh, we don't have to talk too much about this, but um, uh, again, there's, there's some evidence in Colorado that um, overall traffic fatalities uh, uh, decreased since m medical marijuana legalization, um, but more people who die or are seriously injured have marijuana in their systems. Um, so kind of complicated. Um, so right, driving really slowly, yeah. Hit the wall, but not very fast. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm just about, I think, done with uh, my comments. This is, again, more for psychiatric audiences, but it, interestingly, it does not appear that, um, that use of uh, cannabinoids by children and adolescents in a context of seemingly more uh, sort of a, 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 a more permissive societal stance. Nonetheless, it does not look, see you, Dr. Heck, thanks for being here. Uh, does not seem like rates of cannabis um, use are going up in children and adolescents. In fact, they're either flat or going down, but that's again not what we're here to talk about today. So this is my take home. This is mostly again for the medical audience. I think I've made all the important points I wanna make and why don't I stop and see if you have questions or comments. And I also have a list of questions or comments that came from a number of people, including perhaps some of you, and if you want, I can read those out. Wonderful, okay, any questions? Okay, I have questions. Yes. That I got when. Oh, I'm sorry. Super, super quick. So this okay. is the California. I told you I was going to show you this. This is a list of reasons uh, in California uh, why it would be appropriate for a doctor to sign an attestation for medical marijuana. Um, uh, and again, most of it is completely non-evidence based, and that's the sausage making that I referred to before. I apologize for interrupting you. You didn't interrupt. Um, okay. With the final one being the kicker. 12, any other chronic or persistent medical symptom that will either um, impair your ability to do your life activities um, or if not alleviated might cause serious harm. So it's basically whatever ails you, <laughs> right? Okay, that's what California chose to say. That's fine. Yes, please. Oh, one second, let me give you this. One question, um, is this on? Yeah. When you quote the research, it isn't ever clear if the studies on cannabis are, are separating out the THC studies from the CBD studies. They're just all lumped together. And I've always had an interest in the CBD studies, yes. if there are. So, so some of them do, but you're, I think your point is well made that, that a lot of times it's not really sure what we're talking about. Uh, one of the trials I showed you compared nabiximols, which is the one-to-one -one mix of THC and CBD, to THC alone and to placebo, that's about as good as it gets. Um, uh, uh, cannabid, uh, uh, CBD or the, the, the seizure study that I showed you is pure CBD. But you're right, the, the, the examples of, of pure compound versus mixed are few and far between, and they're very few in the domain that we're probably most interested in talking about today. 
uh, which is management of symptoms in um, neuron and tumor and carcinoid. And um, that's unfortunate because, you know, it's, uh, it's true that many people don't like the psychotropic effects of THC, for example, and if there was evidence that CBD alone was an effective pain reliever or an effective anti-nausea medicine, probably lots of people would choose that, but, it's, but we don't have that evidence. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Please. There are, sorry, there are other questions. Should we just oh, go around the room? Great. Is that all right? Wonderful. Yeah. Yes. I was diagnosed in 2001 with carcinoid and I've been on semostatin and had multiple surgeries. I did try smoking pot after surgery and noticeably pain reduction. I didn't have to do Dilaudid mm -hmm. if I could do that mm -hmm. and that worked. But I don't like the psychotropic effects. Yeah. So I started researching CBD, pure CBD yeah. oil and just recently have become a patient over at Cedar sinai uh -huh. told doctor what I want to do. I started CBD oil, pure CBD oil, mm -hmm. a few months ago. And so I have something to compare it to, but I, I want to learn more. Yes. Um, and do you mind if we ask you, what, sure. what is, you don't have to divulge names, but where do you get your CBD oil? It's called Prime My Body. I found it through someone. So it's like a dispensary or? It's, or a, it's a network marketing. Network, Got it. Yeah. Got and it. I just, I thought, well, what do I have to lose? I sure. don't like the psychotropic effects. I'm not going to do that. I tried the vaporizing. Yeah. I tried it. That's not what I wanted. Yeah. Um, I found with this, um, I actually have better memory and I'm sleeping. It took a while to get used to it. You, you had to adjust your dose. Because it caused headaches. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, that was the getting rid of the toxins in mm -hmm. your body. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to go and increase the dose. And I'm wondering, I want, I want <laughs> to see an effect on MRI studies done. So I had an MRI study done. Um, the, the same week that I started this, and then I'm going to have another one in six months. So when I'm you say MRI, maybe you're wondering, might it have an anti-tumor effect? Yes. Yeah, that would be Do great, you know wouldn't of it be? Anything? I, no, I know of none, and and I should just quickly say because actually this was in one of the questions that I got in writing. Um, you know, there's a there's a Canadian sort of uh, thing. There's a guy in Canada who who inserts that topical marijuana made his skin cancer go away, and lots of people are using. Um, various forms of cannabidiol in Canada, as again, as anti-cancer treatment. But it's all anecdote. It's all, you know, this is my experience. And I've met people like that. I mean, you know, I, I met a woman through Sims Mann who had metastatic breast cancer who says that her scans are now completely tumor-free and she's sure it's because she stopped taking all that horrible chemotherapy and started doing cannabis. Maybe that's true. Uh, it, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how to know. I'll let you know. Yeah, great. Good luck. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, I have questions Please. from the live stream. Yeah. Okay. So, the first question is, when the nurses ask if you use any recreational drugs, would the answer still be no if taking medical marijuana? Well, that's a complicated one. So, <laughs> so... Did everybody hear the question? If nur when the nurse asks, do you take any recreational drugs when they're doing your intake, you know, w what would be the appropriate answer in effect? My sense is the appropriate answer would, would have to do with for what purpose or for what use you're, you're using medical marijuana. And if you're using it for symptom reduction, pain, nausea, whatever, I would say I don't think of that as a recreational use. I think of that as a, as a targeting a medical symptom. But that's just my opinion. Do you list this on your list of medications? You list it. So, so if you're if you're using cannabis in one form or another, um, should you let doctors know that when they say, "Show me, tell me your medication list," like carry it in your wallet along with the atorvastatin and the mm -hmm. and the um, acreotide and stuff? I would say yes, but I think probably um, in the in the context of a um, a relationship that you develop with your doctor. Wonderful. Okay. Because I think the the in, the embedded concern is, well, mm -hmm. if I tell this to Joe Schmo doctor, mm -hmm. they're going to think I'm, you know, a substance abuser and they're not going to want to help me or something like that, right? I think that's probably the, the embedded concern. Okay. 
And then next question, when you have blood work done, does it show in the results? So to my knowledge, the only way that um, cannabis would show in results is if you had a tox screen, which is typically of urine, not blood, um, where they screen for the cannabis compounds. Um, but in terms of affecting your, you know, your blood cell count or your other chemistries, no effect of that like that that I know of. Okay. And then last question here. How do we know if there will be an interaction with other meds we take? Yeah. So drug, again, a question about drug interactions. The, the best evidence that I know of I showed in one of the earlier slides, which suggests that whole leaf cannabis is a pretty weak uh, inducer or inhibitor, meaning doesn't have much of an effect on the body's metabolism of other compounds but we don't know from actual clinical stu studies in people. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, one second. Um, hi, I have a hi. question. Uh, basically, marijuana use and withdrawal, which I feel like people think that you, you, know, you can't overdose on it, but um, I would think there is withdrawal for people who use it you know, for a yes. long time or you know, a long time and yes. go without it. And my husband uses it for symptom mm -hmm. reduction Mm -hmm. um, at this point, not for any type of cancer treatment. He's mm -hmm. really specifically for symptoms. And I know he's gone, um, you know, he's been in the hospital, whatnot, and he yes. hasn't been able to have any THC or anything for like a week or so. Yes. And we've just kind of wondered if maybe any extra, you know, mm -hmm. he's already feeling so crappy that mm -hmm. we have no idea, mm -hmm. you know, if that's in, a, in a, uh, yeah. a part of it. But I'm really curious, you know, what is with marijuana withdrawal? So, right. So it's a really great question. And um, we used to think there was no such thing but there clearly is a, a marijuana withdrawal syndrome, um, and it's comprised of um, a little bit of irritability, insomnia, sometimes a little bit of tremulousness, nausea, or diarrhea. Kind of, people think of it as kind of mild. Probably its severity has something to do with how much, how often, like with most things. Um, but, there, but it is a recognized syndrome. Some doctors, it's actually interesting, so, so um, um, one of the anesthesia folks that I work with, um, when people come in for same-day surgeries and have been fasting overnight, um, some people are sophisticated enough to say, you know, I am a regular user of cannabis for this or that, and I haven't had any since yesterday because I follow the directions and, you know, and I feel kind of crappy. They sometimes give intravenous dronabinol as a treatment for cannabis withdrawal. Some addictions doctors use the, the FDA approved versions of cannabis the three, as, a tr as a way of managing withdrawal and craving. So, so it probably exists, there are treatments for it, and, and I hope that helps as an answer. Okay, we have another live stream yeah. question. What is the recommended ratio of CBD to THC for sleep? Unknown. Okay, unknown. The question was what is the recommended ratio of THC uh, for, and to CBD for sleep? Unstudied, unknown. Okay, great. Any other questions? Nobody? Okay. Do you have any last words? Before uh, no, this has ahead? been really fun. I hope it was of interest. Um, and thanks for your great questions and attention. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Strauss. Great. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to turn off the cameras, and we can ask more personal questions if you have any. Thank you to all the viewers who turned, tuned in live to watch us. Um, we will be uh, publishing this video soon in the next few days, so if you tuned in a little late, we'll have the full video available on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Thank you.